Back when I was a law student at a prominent London university, I moved into a shared house in Peckham during the final years of my studies. Half the reason I was so keen on that particular house was that only one of the other apartments was occupied. The trouble with being in a student house is that they tend to be pretty rowdy places. You never know quite when someone is going to bring home a bunch of friends from a club night and spend the wee small hours blasting music in the kitchen or whatever. Obviously, that's not conducive for a good sleeping pattern, and the last thing I wanted was to mess up my important final year by living in some bloody party house. So with the help of some close friends, I moved all my stuff into the flat one morning, with every intention of going upstairs to greet the person that lived on the top floor and the only other person living in the house. But at one point, as I'm moving some bags up the stairs, I looked up the stairwell and saw someone looking down at me with a cold, dull expression on their face. It was a guy, a rather tall one too, with short, cropped blonde hair and very, very pale blue eyes. I mean, they were so pale it was like they shined out of his eye sockets at me. This rather alarming shade of icy blue. I said hi to him in as friendly a way as I could muster, but instead of returning my greeting, he just stared at me for a few moments before slowly backing away from the stairwell. Then I just heard a door slam as he disappeared back into his apartment. The person I was with just kind of gave me an awkward, amused look as we whispered our hopes that he wouldn't end up being a weirdo or anything like that. God, when I look back on it, it was such a hauntingly prophetic moment, if only we knew how right we were. The first few nights were nothing unusual, and I was actually relieved that I get the peace and quiet that I've been hoping for. That was until one evening when I'm sitting in my computer chair and doing some research on international trade law, and I heard something coming from the hallway outside. At first it didn't bother me too much and I simply put on some ambient music that always seemed to help me concentrate and tried to ignore the sounds coming from outside. But as the night went on they seemed to get louder and louder and eventually I couldn't contain my curiosity, walking over to the door so I could get an idea of exactly what they were. It was the sound of screaming in particular, a woman screaming, and it was coming from the apartment upstairs. First, I thought the guy up there was just watching a horror movie or something, and that's what the screaming sound was from. But the longer I listened, the more I realized that whoever was up there was listening to that and only that, like to the point I could hear the audio file or whatever looping at a certain time. He was just up there, listening to the sound of a woman screaming in pain for like an hour straight. I know I should have just gone up there and asked him to turn it down, but... The idea that he was just sitting in his apartment listening to the sound of a woman screaming for that length of time, my god, it scared the life out of me. It was hours before I was silent again. I'm talking like one in the morning before I could finally even think about getting to sleep. Questions were rolling around my mind as I was lying there in the dark. Like what kind of person just listens to stuff like that for hours at a time? Or worse, what if he was watching something criminally violent? What if he was up there watching some kind of snuff film? I lay awake for hours, absolutely terrified of my new situation, one I couldn't just escape from so easily since I'd spent such a huge amount of money on the admin charges, first month's rent, and that sort of thing. I was so bloody worried, and it was with those thoughts echoing through my mind that I finally drifted off to sleep. I was absolutely exhausted during lectures the next day to the point where my mates were asking me if everything was okay, since apparently I looked as rough as a bear. I told them I was fine, but that something was seriously weird about the bloke who lived upstairs. A few of them consoled me with tales of their own weirdo housemates and that, as creepy as he seemed to be, at least he wasn't a perv who was constantly trying to get in my pants or whatever. And I suppose that, in a manner of speaking, they were right. But that night, I just found myself getting pretty angry that this guy was so bloody and considerate, so I put on my big girl pants and marched up to his apartment with every intention of getting him to turn the volume down. So I rock up to his door, knocking on it loudly as I wait for him to answer. Little side note, I've dealt with noisy neighbors before. Usually the moment you knock, the noise turns down. They're embarrassed, apologetic, generally reasonable people. Only with this guy, the noises didn't turn down at all. 
I can't even describe how unnerving it was to hear what was coming from inside that apartment. I still don't know what those screaming sounds were from, be it a movie or a weird noise core album or some other bollocks, but I'm telling you now, they sounded real. They were utterly blood-curdling, the kind of screams you only get out of someone when they know they're about to die. I was positively shaking with fear by the time I heard the door begin to unlock, and when it opened, what I saw was more unnerving than I could possibly imagine. The weird blonde guy that I had seen looking down the stairwell at me just a week or so before, well I assume it was him anyway, was wearing a mask, one that I find hard to describe when I think about it. It was made of varnished wood, I know that, and it looked kind of like a death mask, like the cast of a person's face that's made when they've recently passed away. Only there was something horribly, horribly wrong with this mask. Something that sounds deeply unnerving, it was misshapen, warped, with indistinguishable words or symbols carved into it. But that's not what really freaked me out, because when he opened the door, he was also completely and utterly stark naked. I remember backing up on the spot, putting a bit of a distance between myself and the masked man before I asked him, in the politest way imaginable, if he would be so kind as to turn the music down just a little bit. He didn't even move. He didn't speak. He just stood there, staring back at me from the eye slits that had been cut into the mask. I just kept backing up, shifting my tone from polite request to outright apologetic that I'd been so rude as to disturb him. But still, he didn't move. He didn't make a sound, he just carried on, staring at me. By the time I saw the scars that ran up and down his chest, I just ran back downstairs into my apartment and locked the door behind me, almost hyperventilating with fright as I called a friend who lived nearby and asked if I could stay at their place for a while. They were curious as to why I was so upset, and especially as to why I suddenly didn't want to stay at the flat that I'd previously been so made up with. But once I explained, they invited me around immediately and told me to stay as long as I wanted. From there, I contacted the police and made an indecent exposure complaint, but the officer I spoke to said that without any witnesses, it would be essentially my word against theirs and it was nothing to build a case on. They recommended that, as inconvenient and disappointing as it was, that it was best that I just stay away from this disturbed, masked neighbor person as much as possible. I ended up moving out of that flat as quickly as I could, going back with a few friends during the daytime to collect my things and once again, the guy upstairs watching from up the stairwell, just staring again, completely emotionless. After that, I started to realize why the rest of the flats remained empty. I ended up graduating with a first in my law degree and now I help run a law firm in the city of Birmingham. I remember my time in London well, but... I tried never to think about that empty apartment building ever again. Back when I was a kid, my family and I lived in this super religious neighborhood out in Utah. I know the main reason we moved out there was for peace of mind and security since, although our family wasn't hugely religious, we still went to church on Sundays and stuff like that. We figured that it would be a nice place to live since all the neighbors would be super Christian and whatnot. I mean, they were. Everybody was super friendly. But certain people were really, really weird. Like the neighbor that lived on the right side of us, their whole family seemed really wholesome. And I suppose they were in many ways, but in others, they were just downright creepy and frightening. So, take the first time they came over to visit after we moved in. Their whole family came over for dinner and everything is going really well, despite the fact that we could barely talk to the neighbor's kids. They didn't have a TV over there, so half of the things me and my sister referenced just went right over their heads. But like I said, they were still super nice and you don't need a TV to be able to have fun on a trampoline. Anyway, right in the middle of dinner as the grown-ups are chatting away and we're all tucking into the homemade lasagna my mom had made, one of the kids starts babbling about something. Like I thought they were about to have a fit or something, they came out with this long stream of nonsense words. Not like in another language or whatever, they were just saying one big long word really fast. 
I remember my dad gets up from the table about to grab a pen or something just in case the kid is having an epileptic fit and starts asking the neighbor's dad, is your kid okay? I don't blame him either. The kid's face was all screwed up and it did look like they were in some measure of pain. But instead of getting up to check on the kid, the neighbor's mom clasped her hands together like she's all proud, while the dad raised his hands to the ceiling and starts saying things like, Praise be, praise be to God, for we are blessed. Then he starts explaining to us that the kid talked in tongues sometimes, how they were often possessed by the Holy Spirit and spoke the pure language of the seraphim. I just remember being completely and utterly freaked out, like I'd never seen anything like that in my young life. Then another time, I got up one morning and headed into the bathroom to brush my teeth. So we had frosted glass on the windows, but one was slightly ajar, and through it, I hear this grunting sound coming from the neighbor's backyard. I push the window open slightly and then freak out at what I see. The neighbor dad is standing there in the backyard with what I'm guessing was the Bible in one hand and a kind of whip in the other. He was whipping his own back while reading Bible verses aloud, and he was whipping hard. There were all these little cuts on his back that were just streaming with blood, so I just run to tell my mom and dad about what I'd seen, who actually doubted me for a moment before they, too, got to look at what was going on. My dad called over to politely ask the neighbor guy not to do that in his backyard, and apparently he warmingly agreed to not do it in the view of our house anymore. Needless to say, we didn't invite them over for dinner anymore. But what still kind of freaks me out even today is how nice they were. Even with such violent tendencies and despite how crazy he obviously was, the neighbor dad was one of the warmest, friendliest guys I'd ever met. At least, that's the front he put up. And I wonder if he was the same behind closed doors. I also wonder if the kids really were as well adjusted as they seemed or if they struggled later in life, having grown up in such a weird environment. I'm from a city in the northwest of my country called Garununs. It is a very beautiful place. Some call it the city of flowers. I love Garununs, but I cannot live there anymore. There are too many bad memories for me, and people accuse me of something which I am innocent of. You see, eight years ago, I lived next to a family called the Negromontes. They seemed like very nice people, but they did not have a lot of money since the man of the house, Jorge, could not find a job for some reason. It was spoken in our neighborhood that Jorge could not work because of an illness he had, but he had helped support his family by making and selling pastries to his neighbors, including myself. Jorge made the best empadas and salgados, which are traditional Brazilian pastries that we all love to eat, and on more than one occasion, I found him knocking at my door with a tray of delicious empadas for sale. They were very affordable and very delicious, and I know I am not the only one in our neighborhood who used to buy them very regularly from him. It felt good to be able to help him support his family like that. Some people said Jorge was mentally ill, but it seemed obviously to be that he had some kind of physical condition too. Sometimes, when Jorge called over at my apartment, he would burst out laughing for no reason at all, like he had heard someone tell a funny joke that only he could hear. Sometimes his arms seemed to shake when he had out the tray of empadas for me to look at, and one day, he started having a nosebleed which dripped all over the pastries. He apologized a lot and seemed very nervous as he walked away from my door, but when I assured him it was okay and that I hoped that he would feel better soon, he broke into this high-pitched laughter as he disappeared around a corner. Jorge could act very strange like that, but I just felt sorry for him and kind of admired how determined he was to support his family like that by working hard at making delicious food. But one day, I came home from my job to see a few police cars outside the Negromonte house. All of the neighborhood had come out of their homes to see what was going on, and we were shocked when a forensics team showed up too. These are the police who wear the white overalls and masks, the ones who look for pieces of dead bodies when there had been a murder. There were many rumors about what the family had been doing, but we did not have to wait long to find out what was going on. 
The pictures were all over the newspapers one day, and everyone heard the story being told on the local radio and TV stations. Human remains had been found in the family's backyard, and they were identified as belonging to a local homeless girl named Jessica, who had gone missing some time before. The news reports told us that the Negromantes had apparently lured her into the house with lies that they were looking for a nanny to look after their young child, but had then killed her and buried it in the backyard. We were all shocked by the news, but as time went on, even more disturbing facts were made public regarding the murders. I remember the day that the police had a press conference with journalists from all over the country. They claimed to have found a 50-page book that had been written by Jorge that he had titled Revelations of a Schizophrenic. The book was all about how he claimed to have been hearing voices talking in his head about how he should kill women, how what he did was all part of some kind of terrible satanic purification ritual, and that he had a plan to purify the world and reduce its population. I found this to be extremely disturbing and upsetting, as I would never have imagined that Jorge could ever think like this. He always seemed like such a sweet person, but I guess I was wrong to think that. But somehow, as the weeks went by, we heard things that were somehow even worse, things that destroyed my life as I knew it. Forensics teams had analyzed the entire Negromante house and discovered traces of the murdered woman's body tissue on cooking utensils used by the family. What's more, rather large chunks of flesh have been found to be missing from the bodies most recently buried in their backyard. Police could only come to one conclusion, that the family had been butchering the murdered women before cooking and eating their flesh. But what's more, rumors began to spread that not only had the family been practicing cannibalism, but they had actually sold some of the meat to the neighboring community in their empadas and salgados. It was horrifying to learn, as, of course, I had bought Jorge's pastries from him many times before, and not only had I eaten them, I thought they were very tasty. I remember sitting on my couch watching the TV when I heard the news. The room began to spin. I felt numb for a few moments, unable to properly compute the information that I had just heard, until it all became clear to me in one single horrible moment. I had eaten human flesh without my knowledge. I ran to the toilet and was violently sick. This was all traumatizing enough for me, but then rumors began to spread that the whole community was part of some satanic cult, and that we actually knew that we were eating it. People from all over the city came to our neighborhood to harass the people living there, including myself. Despite our denials, they called us all cannibals and told us that we were no longer welcome to live in Garanuns. I personally had a note posted through my door from someone anonymous telling me that I would be killed in revenge if I did not leave the city. I didn't want to risk my life, so I left for the coastal city very far away from Garanuns, where I currently live alone. I don't eat meat anymore. I am purely vegetarian because the taste of meat brings back horrible memories for me and makes me instantly sick every time I taste it. So, now you understand why I don't wish to give my name or give too much information as to where I live, as I'm afraid I'll be hunted by these people seeking vengeance for Jorge Negromonte's terrible crimes. But I swear to Jesus Christ I did not know what I was eating and if I ever did, I would not have eaten it, and I would have reported Jorge to the police. So please, although you think you might know who your neighbors are, ask yourself, do I really know who I'm living next to? Do I really know what they're doing behind closed doors? Because for some of us, we don't know exactly who our neighbors are. Not until it's far too late. A few years ago, I came home from work to find my girlfriend sitting on the couch with a glum look on her face. When I asked her what the matter was, she gave me that fateful line, We need to talk. She told me she wasn't happy in our relationship anymore and that she thought that we should take a break to see other people, essentially so we could decide if we really were supposed to be together. I really didn't want to, but I loved her enough to respect her decision and I agreed. 
I thought if I at least gave her idea a try, I'd eventually win her back, but a few weeks later our relationship was well and truly over, and I had to move out of the apartment that we shared. Since it was technically her apartment first, obviously I had to find a new place to live and fast, so I definitely didn't take all the time I should have to find somewhere decent, and I ended up paying for it pretty badly. The place I ended up renting was a one-room studio apartment in a building that straight up looked like a haunted house. I mean, that probably should have been a warning right there, but it was cheap, available, and the landlord only wanted a month's rent in advance to exchange for the keys. Plus, there was absolutely no way I was about to move back in with my mom and dad, like they'd be nice enough to offer, but it would have felt like way too much like a step back, and so I opted for the studio. Moving in was easy enough. I didn't have all that much in the way of possessions to take with me and honestly, I just couldn't be bothered arguing with my then ex-girlfriend about who was entitled to what. The whole thing had been unpleasant enough without souring the broken relationship even further with petty arguments over furniture. Besides, as long as I had my Xbox and my 4K telly, I'd be happy enough. So the day after I move in, I knock at the flat across the hall for me to introduce myself to my neighbor. There was this thumping bass beat coming from the other side, so I knew someone was home, but when they answered, I was pretty shocked at how frank and unfriendly they were. The guy was quite young, with thick, dark beard and a cockney accent, and he didn't open the door the whole way. He just opened, like, a little crack before peering out. I introduced myself, told him I moved in across the hallway from him, and added that if he ever needed to borrow a cup of sugar or anything, he knew where to find me but all I got in return was this cold, nervous stare. I figured I might have interrupted him in something, so I apologized and added that my name was Ollie. He replied, telling me his name was Jack. I know this sounds mad, but I got the distinct impression it was a name that he just plucked out of the air. Just something in my gut told me that, as weird as this sounds, and that he just made it up on the spot. But I'm not really the paranoid type, so I just put it down to him being a generally awkward person or whatever before I disappeared back into my flat. A few weeks later, I was just leaving my flat to head off to work when I saw a guy leaving Jack's flat. I wished him a good morning, and he wished me the same, and I followed up by asking him if he was one of Jack's friends or his flatmate or something. Who? He replies. It was then that I smelled the alcohol in his breath. I repeated the question pointing towards the door of the flat and reiterating that it was Jack's flat. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Jack's mate, he said, before continuing down the stairs and out the front door. Now this one I definitely knew was a lie, and it was that which clued me into the fact that the original guy had been lying to me too. Something weird was going on with that flat, but just exactly what it was I couldn't possibly imagine at that stage. So... This keeps happening for about a fortnight longer with me catching different people going in and out of the flat across the hallway at all hours of the night. So when the landlord calls to pick up the next month's rent, I bring up the tenants from across the hall and ask him exactly who it is that lives there. He racks his brain for a moment, finally coming up with the name Stephen as the name of the tenant, adding that he's the best tenant he's ever had, how there are no noise complaints, how he always pays the rent on time and on the first day of every month via a direct debit deposit into his bank account. I was on the verge of telling him all about the different people I'd seen, but it wasn't really any of my business, was it? I mean, yeah, it was probably something a bit dodgy going on over there, but as long as no one was getting hurt, what did it have to do with me? I'm not a grass, so I've never been. It's just not my nature, so... I kept my gob shut, even though in time I'd really, really wish that I hadn't. About a week later, I was asleep in bed when something woke me up, a sound coming from outside my flat. It was of heavy footfalls on the stairs, and somehow I knew it was something to do with the flat across the hall. As I lay there, all blurry-eyed, I finally decided that I was going to put a complaint into the landlord, but was nearly scared out of my skin when... I heard a series of loud bangs on the front of my flat. Merseyside Police, open the door or we smash it in. My heart began to race, so hard that I could actually hear it pumping in my ears. I was frozen to the spot for a moment and it took another few bangs and another shock before I could even get my head together. 
I ran to the threshold, pulling back the mortise lock before opening up the door. The next thing I know there's a torch in my face, completely blinding me as a pair of armed, tactically dressed policemen storm in my flat and throw me to the ground. Hands behind your back, move and you're getting shot, one screamed, not even waiting for me to obey him as he pulled my hands into the small of my back and placed them in cuffs. Get the bloody light on, Rich, he said to the other policemen, pulling me up onto my knees and telling me to stay put. So I'm up on my knees, facing the door of my flat with the other officer keeping his back against the door, drawing it open. I can see that there is another pair of police officers who have been banging the door of the flat across the hall, only there is no reply from inside. No one comes to open the door. So up comes this other policeman with one of those door basher things. I don't know the proper name, only that one of the police called it the big key. They smashed their way into the door, screaming as they went. I figured they'd start dragging out whoever was in there, or at least being as aggressive as they were with me. But bizarrely, it was almost the opposite tone. It was verging on kind and caring, and I listened in confusion as they asked the person, Are you alright? Do you know where you are? Can you hear me? It was a minute or so later I watched in absolute horror as one officer walked out of the flat carrying a girl who couldn't have been any older than a teenager. She was barely dressed, covered in bruises, and her hair was a greasy mess that was plastered to her scalp. I looked up at one of the officers, a look of pure shock and revulsion on my face. Let me guess, you didn't know anything about it. Why don't you just save it for the interview, he says. But I didn't. I swear to God I didn't. And I told the police who questioned me down at the station the exact thing when they asked me all sorts of things about human trafficking rings. I broke down in tears when they tried to get me to admit that I was the ringleader or something, and swore blind that I had no idea what they were talking about, and that I'd never do anything like that, and that I just didn't have it in me. Eventually, they let me go, satisfied that I didn't have anything to do with it, but I was horrified that something like that couldn't have been going on right under my nose, that I'd smiled and joked with some of the scumbags that I'd frequented that flat, completely unaware of the hellishly cruel things they'd been getting up to inside of it. I ended up moving back in with my mom and dad not long after, I just couldn't live in that place anymore, and I couldn't cope with looking for a new place, not with the intense paranoia of not knowing what was going on behind the closed doors all around me. So please... As much as it might go against all of your F the police mentalities, just call the police if you think something weird is happening like that near you, because it is our business, it's all of our business, and that decision might be the difference between someone's freedom and an existence of pure torture. When my wife and I moved out to St. Peter's, Missouri, it was honestly one of the happiest times of our lives. I always did love St. Louis, with all of the French colonial architecture and the incredible cathedrals, but that is one crazy city, and I feel like a person only has so much of that fast living in them before they just grow tired of it and need to slow down. We had to wait a little while to save up and get various promotions in our respective careers, but once we were all set, we took the plunge and made the move. It was like our own perfect slice of suburban heaven. The city of St. Peter's was quiet, had amazing high schools, and boasted over 20 parks. I mean, in essence, the whole thing was just one big park. An ocean of green compared to the concrete jungle of St. Louis. Not to mention that the big city is only like a half hour's drive away, 45 minutes in slow traffic, so it wasn't like the move was going to affect our careers any. We thought we had made it. Oops. We thought we had it made. We thought we were living the dream. But it didn't take long for that dream to turn into a nightmare, the likes of which neither me nor my wife could ever imagine. We lived on a place called Laura Hill Street and were quite close with the neighbors on either side of us. One house contained a young couple with their infant son who we often enjoyed having weekend barbecues with while we on... Ugh. One house contained a young couple with their infant son, 
who we often enjoyed having weekend barbecues with while we unwound from the busy working week. But in the other house lived a charming retired couple. They were kind of quiet and kept to themselves. I mean, they were really old, so it wasn't like they could go bounding around the neighborhood like spring chickens, being all sociable and whatnot. I'd have worried a little more about their well-being if it wasn't for the fact that their grandson lived with them, who worked as a nurse down at a local hospital. He helped out with household chores and made sure that they had everything they needed. I remember feeling pretty glad that they had someone as thoughtful and caring as him to help around the home. So one day, as I'm driving home from work after a particularly grueling day, when I see something lying in the road that stands in stark contrast with the picturesque suburban neighborhood, it's something small and furry, something that's covered in dark clots of dried blood, something lying lifeless at the side of the perfectly tarmac street. It was a dead cat. My heart broke for the poor little guy. Whoever had apparently hit the thing with their car hadn't bothered to hang around to clean up the mess, and that just made me angry as well as sad. I know that might be too much to ask of some people. Maybe they were just too shocked and scared to stick around to face the consequences and make things right. But Jesus, leaving the poor little guy just lying there for the entire neighborhood kids to see, not cool. Not cool at all. Our house was just like a hundred yards or so down the street, so I turn into my driveway before fetching a trash bag from the kitchen. I don't even greet my wife as I do so, so immediately she knows something is wrong and follows me back out into the street where she gasps at how I wrap the black plastic around the poor little dude's body. I didn't know what else to do. I wasn't about to toss it in the trash with the rest of our garbage. That little kitty was someone's pet and I don't know, maybe they want to give the poor guy a proper funeral or something. I'm an animal lover, what can I say? So I put its poor broken body into the deep freezer in our garage and waited for the missing posters to pop up around the neighborhood so I could give the family the bad news. However, no missing posters did show up. So a few days later, I take the little guy's body down to the local animal shelter, then just trying to forget about the whole thing. A few days later, it's a warm Saturday morning and I'm just out the door to my house to head off on a morning jog when I see the neighbor's grandson getting out of his car with one of those pet carriers in hand. I hadn't quite had the chance to introduce myself to him yet, so I walk down my driveway, giving my heartiest good morning. Naturally, he returns the greeting in a friendly tone and I ask him what he's got in the pet carrier. He tells me it's a new cat he's gotten off of Craigslist something for his grandparents to cuddle to give their twilight years just a little more joy. I thought that was an incredibly sweet thing for him to do, and without mentioning the poor cat that lost its life in the neighborhood, I tell him I hope he's planning on keeping an indoor cat as sometimes they can go astray and never return home. He assures me it's definitely going to be an inside cat because there's no way his grandma would ever let the thing out of her sight once she's seen how cute it is. That reassured me a great deal. There was no way I could face trash bagging another furry friend, not after the last one. So I tell him what a lucky pair they are to have such a thoughtful grandson, then head off on my morning jog. The next morning, the male half of the younger couple on the other side of us knocks on our door and asks to speak with me. I said a silent prayer that he's not about to cancel our barbecue that afternoon, as it was our turn to get all the meats for the affair and I didn't want to put them all in the freezer for the following week, not since it had recently been little more than a coffin for the dead cat I'd found in the street. He has this grave look on his face, so my mind is already made up that he's about to cancel, but the news was even worse than that. In a low voice, he asked me to step outside into the drive with him. I oblige him, following him outside as he asked me a question in a similarly low voice. I'll try to write out the conversation from memory. Did you... did you see or hear anything weird last night? Uh, I don't think so. What kind of thing would I have heard? I don't know, like an animal attack? A distressed cat, something like that? No, man, I didn't hear a thing. Why? Just... just come look. Tim takes me over to his property into the front yard and over to some rose bushes that I'd seen his wife lovingly pruning from time to time. There, underneath them, was another mess of blood and fur, another dead cat. 
only this one looked fresh, very fresh, and it had been ripped apart. You think a bobcat could have done something like that? Tim asked me. I don't think we get bobcats this close to the city, buddy, but I don't know. Anything's possible, I suppose. I replied, horrified and confused. But I mean, if something killed this thing last night, right here in my own front yard, he'd have heard it, right? We'd heard something. I had no idea what to tell him. I know it was only a cat, but Jesus, we were both pretty freaked out by the whole thing, especially me, since this wasn't even the first dead cat I'd seen on Laura Hill Street in the past few weeks alone. We both agreed to keep our eyes and ears peeled for anything suspicious, and then agreed to meet later that afternoon for the Sunday BBQ. But before me and my wife went over to Tim's house for the BBQ, I made sure to make a stopover at our other neighbor's place, just to make sure their cat was okay. A minute or so after I rang their doorbell, the grandma answered, and no sooner had I asked after the well-being of their own cat that I heard a high-pitched meowing just a few feet behind her. The grandma apologized and told me she'd have to shut the door before the little guy tried to get out. I told her I totally understood, wished her a lovely morning and then headed back to my house. My fears abated. The BBQ that afternoon was kind of tense. Tim and his wife seemed kind of off, and in the end, I had to tell my wife what seemed to be happening in the neighborhood, how there had been two dead cats inexplicably killed and dumped in the past fortnight on our own street. She was extremely upset by the revelation, but I'm honestly glad I told her or she might not have picked up on something that she noticed a few days later. You see, my wife sometimes worked from home, given that her job gave her a pretty flexible schedule and she could pretty much make her own hours. So I'm at the St. Louis office one afternoon when my phone starts buzzing with a bombardment of text messages. They're from my wife, and she's asking me to call her as soon as possible and then it's about the neighborhood cat killings. I called her as soon as I was able. She told me she'd bumped into the neighbor's grandson, Kane, in the local Walmart and approached him to make some casual conversation when she'd noticed something in his arms. There were scabbed cuts all up and down one of his forearms, pretty nasty looking cuts too. She expressed concern about them as she told me that they looked pretty sore, but that Kane had laughed it off and told her that he had picked them up at work when an elderly hospital patient had become belligerent during some routine treatment. Her voice was all shaky, a heavy mix of fear and anger, when she told me that she knew that Kane was lying. The cuts on his arms were from cat claws, how she'd recognized them anywhere since she'd had a few cats as a childhood pet. One scratch in particular was really obvious set of parallel lines and how if they were indeed from a violent hospital patient, they must have had the smallest hands in the freaking universe. After that, my wife was obsessed with the idea that Kane had something to do with the cat killings that were plaguing our neighborhood and her fears were compounded by the fact that we'd actually received a letter through our door from the local homeowners association that mentioned that several other dead cats had been found in people's yards and local parks, but that not a single family had reported their pet cats going missing. We were like amateur detectives by that point, having determined that whoever was killing these cats wasn't just abducting or trapping neighborhood pets, that they had to be bringing them in from somewhere else, somewhere like Craigslist, but it wasn't like we could just accuse Kane of such a heinous series of crimes, after all. The cat he'd brought from his grandparents seemed to be alive and well, or so we thought. One evening, my wife was peeking out of the kitchen window towards the neighbor's house that Kane lived at. It was something she'd taken to doing an awful lot, and I was beginning to think that her obsession with him was verging on paranoia, since she only ever observed him undertaking routine household chores for his elderly grandparents. But this one evening, she was doing her usual peeking as I sat watching football highlights when she cried out, Oh my god! and came running into the kitchen. When I asked her what was up, she told me that she'd just seen Kane taking out a trash bag that looked suspiciously empty like there was only something cat-sized in it. I think I just wanted a little certainty at that point, so I agreed to wait until dark before going out to the trash cans and checking out what she'd seen. When nightfall came, I made sure the coast was clear. 
then crept over to the neighbor's trash cans to check out what my wife had seen. Lo and behold, in a black plastic trash bag right at the top of the can was a bag containing none other than a dead cat, butchered in exactly the same way as the one our neighbor Tim had found in his front yard. It was the one he'd bought off of Craigslist, the cute little tabby cat that I'd seen behind the grandma that day that I'd gone over to make sure it was okay. I walked back inside as calmly as I could and immediately called the cops. Within an hour or so, a patrol car had pulled up outside of Kane's place, and my wife and I watched from a window as the police initially chatted to the grandparents before talking their way inside to search the property. Then, when we saw the cops emerging from the house again, with Kane's handcuffed hands behind his back, my wife just kind of lost her cool, running out front of her house and shouting all kinds of profanity at him. Days later, it was all over the news. Kane had been charged with 12 counts of felony animal abuse after he'd admitted that he'd use Craigslist to collect the cats that he would abuse, torture, and kill. According to statements that he'd made to the police that night, he never intended on caring for any of the cats. Instead, he wanted to strangle them or drown them all in a bucket in his grandparents' backyard. That wasn't even the worst of it, though. Not by a long shot. Kane admitted to officers that he had dismembered some by removing the heads or cutting off the limbs. He also frequently stomped on the heads of the animals before removing their limbs and getting rid of their remains by dumping them throughout his neighborhood in an attempt to terrify those of us that lived on Laura Hill Street. The last I heard, he was being held in St. Charles County Jail with a $50,000 bond on his head, a bond that his shocked and appalled grandparents had absolutely no intention of paying. I think what disturbs me the most about the whole thing isn't so much what Kane was doing, but how he seemed like the least likely person to do the kind of things he did. He seemed like such a nice young man, one who gave up almost all of his time helping people at his nursing job or helping his grandparents around the house. I thought Kane to be something of a saint when I first met him. But now it was all just a front. Cain had the devil in him and I'm just glad we managed to figure that out before he hurt anything else. I grew up here in Germany and used to live near this older man who lived with his wife and his dog a few doors away in this really big fancy house. His wife was considerably more sociable than he was, and the man himself seemed very antisocial and grumpy, and very rarely did he actually talk to any of us neighbor folk. There really didn't seem to be anything wrong with either of them, just your average, childless married couple. One morning I left my house at the usual time to catch the bus to school. Our suburban street was relatively quiet, and normally there wasn't much going on, it was generally a pretty boring place to grow up. But that particular morning was a little bit different. A few of our neighbors were standing out in the street and I'm pretty sure I heard some of them talking about how something was wrong with the other guy in the big house, but exactly what that was I had no idea. So I went off to school and didn't think much about it. But when the school day ended and I headed home, I saw that the whole street was cordoned off and evacuated by police. Police cars were everywhere and there was even this big GS G9 truck there, which is like German version of SWAT. I had no idea what was going on. I saw my parents near the cordon and they explained to me that the old guy had tried to end his own life and planned to take the whole street with him. This guy had filled his entire basement with petrol and had an improvised explosive hidden in his garden shed, which was essentially a big pile of propane gas tanks tied together. The whole thing was rigged to explode in the morning, but thankfully something had gone wrong. A smaller version of this explosive was placed in the garbage can of the people who live right next to this maniac. Before the old man triggered the bomb, he wrecked the entire interior of his house with an axe and then went to the garage with his poor dog, locked the gate, and turned his car engine on. He locked his poor dog in the boot of the car before sitting himself in the driver's seat waiting to die from carbon monoxide asphyxiation because he was too cowardly to wait to be blown up by the bomb himself. Luckily, the plan didn't work out, because the neighbor heard the car engine and became suspicious. 
He looked through the garage window and at first thought the man had a heart attack, so he broke the window and entered only to see the man more or less conscious in his car. Then he noticed the distinctive smell of petrol. He broke the door to enter the house and discover the mess the old guy created. The neighbor immediately called the cops and a bomb squad took care of the explosive just in time. Unfortunately, the dog suffocated in the trunk and was already dead. The authorities arrested that guy and put him into a mental health facility. He will remain there until the end of his life. The estimated blast radius of the bomb would have been enough to destroy several houses and do an incredible amount of damage to the surrounding area. This all happened back in 2010 in the city of Ingolstadt and the story was all over the German news, so you can look this up for yourself to see that this is not something I simply made up for karma. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and get and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, crack is whack.